Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to discuss the Maitland classifications for mobilizations and manipulations. And this is going to include four major grades, so grades one through four. And then sometimes there's also a grade five that we can use called a manipulation. And we'll discuss that at the very end of this video. But before we do that, we need to talk about this basic analogy right here for how we apply mobilizations. Now, obviously, when you're mobilizing like this, it doesn't matter if it's the back or any other part of the body, you are either directly or indirectly putting pressure on the patient's skin. And there's obviously other tissues deep to that. So connective tissues, collagen, all sorts of soft tissue. And this string or band right here is going to represent that soft tissue. Now initially, when there's no pressure being applied to it, you could think of the soft tissue as having slack in it like this. Okay, there's certainly no tension being applied to this, right? It has slack in it. And the analogy we can use is a rubber band like this. The rubber band obviously has some bends in it. It's not being pulled yet. But we can obviously take this string or this band and we can pull on either end, really applying no tension to it. We're just simply removing the slack and lengthening it out into its fully lengthened form like you see right here. This is called removing the slack. And the slack is of course represented by all of these curves, right? We just removed that slack and now we fully lengthened it out. If we're looking at this rubber band, in this position, we really wouldn't need to pull on it that hard. All we'd be doing is tugging on each end a little bit, just enough to take the slack out of that rubber band. This point at which we've removed all the slack from this string or band, but before we apply any more stretch to it to lengthen it beyond this point, this is what we call R1, or the first resistance. So once we just get all the slack out of the band, that is R1. Now this takes a lot of practice to be able to do, but if you put your hand initially resting on somebody's back and you gradually, slowly apply more and more pressure to the back, Eventually, you'll remove all the slack from that soft tissue in the back and you'll feel an initial resistance. And beyond that, it takes even more pressure to be able to push further. That initial resistance is the tissues R1. That's the point at which you've removed all the slack. Now, once we've reached the R1 of this string or this rubber band, right, we can stretch it even more by adding even more tension, right? And from life experience, we know that when we stretch this band, it's going to increase in length, as you see right here, but it's also going to become thinner, right? And we can keep stretching it, right? And at some point, if we were to stretch it any further, it would start to tear, right? And it might actually break. Well, right around the end range of movement, this is where we feel the final resistance, and this is R2. So in the case of the rubber band, R2 is somewhere around the end of the movement where you feel that final resistance, where if you pull any more, it might actually snap the rubber band. Now back to our back example, as we're pushing past R1, that first resistance, we can continue pushing down into the back, right? But at some point, there's going to be a physiological limit of how much pressure we can apply, how much we can push into that region of the body. And we'll feel a second resistance that's tougher than the first. And that second resistance is R2. Now, you can go a little bit into R2. It's not going to automatically result in injury, but you don't want to go super far past R2 because then you can have tissues that tear, you can have injury, and so on and so forth. And so when we're doing mobilizations, we still have our skin right here. We have all this soft tissue beneath. We have the more superficial R1, the deeper R2. And so we can apply varying amounts of pressure here. So I can maybe hang out before R1, I can go down to R1, right? I could even go past R1 down to R2 right here. Maybe I want to oscillate between R1 and R2. And I can even maybe oscillate closer to R2 like this. And in some cases, you can go a little bit past R2, but you don't want to go too far past it. Because if I start going down to here, then that would probably result in tearing of certain tissues 
and injury. And so when we look at manipulations at the end of the video, we're only going to go a little bit past that R2. And honestly, knowing the exact R1s and R2s really just takes a lot of practice doing this on different people. So we're about to get into the Maitland classification, the grades of mobilizations. And what we're going to find is that these different grades are going to oscillate around different resistances. Some are going to hang out more around R1 and, and uh, lighter, and some are going to be between R1 and R2. Let's go take a look at those right now. Let's start off by talking about grade one mobilizations. These are small amplitude movements at the beginning of the available range of movement. So we're starting off at the beginning, which is basically just the surface of the skin, and we're pushing on that soft tissue, but we're not getting up to R1. So we're not taking up all the slack in the soft tissue, we're only taking up some of the slack. We haven't yet felt that first tissue resistance where we've taken up all the slack. The best way to think about grade one mobilizations is these are basically just baby reps, and you can see that there in the animation. Give me baby reps right now without walking, just do baby reps, little baby reps. Baby reps, what? Yeah, just stay there, Adam. Now, grade two mobilizations are similar to grade one, except for the fact that they're large amplitude movements and they go all the way to R1. So remember, R1 is the point where we've taken up all the slack in the soft tissue that we're pushing on. And so we start at the beginning, so right at the skin surface, but it's large amplitude in the sense that instead of stopping prior to R1, we're going all the way from the skin surface down to R1 where we feel that first tissue resistance. And that first tissue resistance, of course, is where you've taken up all of that slack in the soft tissue. And generally speaking with grade twos, we're not really putting any more tension beyond that. We're not pushing beyond the point where we've taken up all the slack. So beyond R1, that's really where we get to grade three and four mobilizations. Let's look at those. Now grade three mobilizations are large amplitude movements that move into stiffness or muscle spasm. And the basic idea is we're beginning at R1, the point where we've taken up all the slack, and now we're applying even more pressure and we're pushing that tissue beyond to R2. And R2 is really that end range of available movement. We really can't go beyond that much because if we go beyond that, we might risk tearing some tissue and getting some injury. But generally speaking, grade three mobilizations move between R1 and R2. Now grade four mobilizations, we're really oscillating right around that end range, right around R2. So you can see that the start point is going to be somewhere after R1, so between R1 and R2, and then the end of the mobilization is right around R2 end range. And you can see that right here. So the oscillations are right near that end range. And they're small amplitude because they don't cover that whole distance from R1 to R2. They start at about the halfway point, so to speak, between them, and then just up to R2, back and forth. Now when we look at grade one through four mobilizations, the rate and the duration really aren't that much different. In terms of the rate, we're gonna treat them as oscillations, right? We're not just doing it once, we're oscillating. And we're doing it at a rate of about two hertz, which is basically 120 movements per minute. This is exactly the rate that you would do if you're performing CPR on somebody. They always said do it to the beat of staying alive by the Bee Gees. That's usually what they say. It's really that rate that you're doing these mobilizations at, and you can do them a little bit slower. Okay, But the key is that these are oscillations. And for the duration, you're going to usually start out anywhere between 30 seconds and a minute. Generally speaking, when you're assessing a patient's response the very first time you do this, you want to start out on the lower end, so maybe 30 seconds, and if they can tolerate it really well and it helps them, then maybe gradually increase that to a minute. And you might be able to do a couple or a few sets of this within one treatment session. And that's the same for grades one through four. The difference is when you would actually use these. So grades one and two mobilizations are actually best for pain reduction. And in fact, they can reduce both pain severity and irritability. And so you'd of course want to do a pre and post test uh, before and after you actually do these mobilizations. And that could be a pain type of scale. So severity out of 10, an example being the numeric pain rating scale. So you do it before you do the mobilization, whether it's one or two and after. So pain reduction, grades one and two. In contrast, grades three and four mobilizations are best for increasing range of motion, which makes sense. 
We're starting already at R1, where we've already taken the slack out of the tissue, and then we're stretching it to R2, near the end range of the movement, where it won't go any further. And so by stretching it past that R1, we're really helping, helping to loosen all those little collagen fibers and other things within the tissue itself and stretch those. And so this can be good for increasing range of motion. And obviously you do a pre and post test, something that indicates the range of motion. If you want to be objective, you could use goniometry before the mobilization and after. And so grades three and four are good for increasing range of motion. Now, sometimes they'll talk about another grade, which is a grade five mobilization. Now, the grade five mobilization is a high velocity, low amplitude thrust near the end range. And so the basic idea here is that you basically take up all the slack in the tissue and stretch it to about R2. And you just hold there, and then you give a quick thrust. And you'll see that here in the animation. So they're going all the way to R2, and then you see that quick thrust. Quick thrust right past R2. Um, this one often needs patient consent, uh, written consent that is in some states, and this is something that you need special training to be able to do. Grade five mobilizations are often called manipulations. You'll hear this term. Now there's two major differences between mobilizations and this grade five manipulation. In a mobilization, they're oscillation movements, right? We talked about that. We could do oscillations at a rate of about two hertz or 120 per minute, right? And then we do it usually 30 seconds to a minute. With manipulations, these are not oscillations. You never do oscillations with these. There's really just going to that end range and then a quick thrust. And that thrust or the manipulation is only done once or twice on that spot. You don't do it many, many times. Usually once or twice is all that you do. Okay? And generally speaking, um, the manipulations where you hear that cavitation, where you hear the joint pop, people pop their knuckles like that. Okay. And if you hear the cavitation the first time, usually you don't need to do the manipulation again. You usually will do it a second time if you don't hear the cavitation on the first manipulation attempt. But generally speaking, you're not going to do a manipulation more than twice on the same part of the body. Okay. Now, the second difference between mobilizations and manipulations is whether or not uh, the patient can protect or resist against the movement. So a mobilization is obviously a lot slower. And so because mobilizations are slower, it gives the patient a chance to resist that movement. Okay. So they could actively contract against it. A manipulation is fast enough to where there's no way that the patient would be able to react in time to resist the movement. Okay, So when you look at that thrust right at the end, there's no way that a patient would be able to react in time and actively resist against that thrust. And that's another thing that makes this a manipulation. But the manipulation is a high velocity, low amplitude thrust near the end range. So you start right around that R2 and then a quick thrust. Now in general, with grade five mobilizations or manipulations, they can actually both increase range of motion, which you can assess just by functional movement or goniometry, but they can also reduce pain, which again, you can assess using that numeric pain rating scale. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the Maitland classifications for mobilizations, and then also the difference between the manipulation, which is grade five, and the other types of mobilizations. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.